Hello. Uh, so uh, could you introduce our, yourself to our audience and uh, we can start off with the questions and but give us a little background about where you're coming from and where you'd like to take this conversation. Absolutely. I think first of all, I'll start with really thanking you for your generosity. You have been so kind with, you know, sharing so much information and resource on LND and your time today with me. So um, this is what sort of, you know, got me introduced to you via one of my LND mentors. So I am uh, an LND professional currently. My background has been mostly on the data space. And I work with one of the major four banks here in Australia. And I'm a very keen learner. I want to keep learning about learning. And it's always good to hear perspectives. And it's very rare to find someone who spent four decades in this space. So it's it's amazing to, you know, to be able to talk to someone and um, hear and learn more about how things are changing, what are the latest trends, what makes sense, what is, you know, completely nonsense and can be avoided for someone like me. So that's the entire purpose. So in short, I'm a keen learner who wants to talk to a very experienced learner and professional in the space. Well, thank you for all of that. So, so what can I help you with? Great. So um, there are a few questions on which, you know, I'm trying to gather more information or sort of, you know, get my understanding clear. And the first thing which is sort of, you know, used a lot these days is learning in the flow of work. And as learning professional, uh, as a learning professional, I want to make sure that I'm I understand this really well so that I can enable people learn in the flow of work. So, and the other thing is now, you know, things have changed. The way we work has changed. So how has hybrid work changed this? So first let's understand what's learning in the flow of work from you and then the impact of hybrid work on that. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, the concept, the notion of, uh, learning in the flow of the work, I think, is somewhat of a misnomer. It's misnamed um, because I think that uh, we can provide guidance in the workflow that would tell me step by step what I must do. That means I, I don't have to have memorized that before I perform. I follow some sort of guidance, whether it's a checklist or a flow chart or just a set of instructional steps that tell me do this. It's like uh, assembling a, a bookshelf. They give you a set of instructions. And so that, but you but you don't learn and memorize that unless you do it often enough and then you no longer need that guidance. So I was first introduced to that notion back in my first day out of college in my first job in a training organization. And there was an article from 1970 from Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert. And it was their Praxis newsletter from September and October of 1970. And it talked about guidance, the short way home. So instead of forcing people to memorize things in our training programs, we can give them this guidance. Memories are faulty. And if we have a lot of complicated steps and there may be branching if a situational conditions, you do it this way or that way, we we can't expect people to memorize that. And if the if it's about high stakes performance with high risks and rewards, it's problematic to give people a learning experience and expect them to memorize all of that along with everything else. So uh, while there could be learning in the workflow and we do learn as we work, I think oftentimes we need to provide what I call performance guides instead of a learning experience. When the performance context does not demand a memorized performance response and allows for a referenced performance response, we can provide uh, performance guides. But let's say you're, you're, the bank is being robbed. All right, there's no time to look anything up and the manager and branch managers and assistant managers and everybody should have memorized what they need to do and just as importantly, what they need to not do. And because they can't reference that it's on demand and that demand may not have been predictable, but we need people to have memorized what are the appropriate things to do and not to do. And 
it, in a situation like that, where we would put them through a learning experience and teach them that, but we can't expect them not to forget it if we don't refresh that. So we provide spaced learning uh, in some sort of a cadence and some sort of a routine manner so that we can refresh guys' memory of what to do and not to do. And there's various ways of, of doing that. But the goal is to enable me to perform appropriately with competence when the time comes. So we have the two options. So, but learning in the workflow, uh, oftentimes I can use performance support and not learn it. And the next time I need to do that task set, I will go get that performance support and read it and follow it again. So learning is a bit of a misnomer in that situation. And I think uh, the, the name change in our field from instruction to training to learning has fuzzied up as, uh, uh, and fogged up some of the um, what, what we're really trying to do because enterprise learning, different from educational learning, but in an enterprise, we're trying to help people perform on the job. And to me, that means they need to be able to perform tasks to produce outputs that meet the stakeholder requirements. And it, it, we can't expect people to memorize too many things. So I, I, so I, I struggle with the language, but the language in our field has been a problem since I first got into it 43 years ago, and I don't think it's ever going to change, but it makes it more difficult for people coming into the field and climbing the learning curve is that we have all this different language, uh, guidance, job aids, performance aids, electronic performance support systems, um, quick reference guides, performance support, workflow learning. Those are just some of the labels we've given this concept of learning in the workflow. Um, it, it doesn't normally mean, but it could mean, I stop my work and I go take an e-learning module of some duration then I might be learning in the workflow versus being guided in the workflow. And that's this is where it gets all kind of fuzzy. I, I hope that helps. Yep, that does help. And uh, what about the hybrid uh, work environment impacts? Do you think anything has changed? Wait, is this where you, so by hybrid, let's make sure that I understand what you mean by that. Is this people maybe working remotely, working from home, working in the office, working uh, at different team sites? Uh, yeah. wherever that might so, be? So a couple of years back, the team which used to, you know, sit next to each other and do the work is uh, working remotely and just seeing each other through the virtual world. Yeah, so I think that uh, uh, what's needed here is for our processes to be re-examined to see how they might need to be modified for asynchronous work. If we were all in the same room together working on something, we're working synchronously on something and you can make a decision and that informs me and what I'm going to do. I can do my thing and hand it off to the next person. But now that we're, we have uh, time and distance perhaps, and we're not working synchronously, if we were to do this work asynchronously and hand things off, do our processes facilitate that? Are they designed for working that way? And they either are or they aren't. But then it comes to how do we uh, help people learn how to work in that? Well, we have to teach them what those processes are and what their responsibilities are. And if you do your thing and hand it off to me, I may need to learn that I have X amount of time to do my thing and hand it off. Otherwise, I become the bottleneck. So I think a lot of this and in all of the cases with learning is that we need to be teaching people, helping people learn how to perform in their processes. And whether those are rote processes, there's only one way to do it, and you do it this way each and every time, or whether those processes need to vary situationally, depending on the conditions that exist at the time of performance. We need to teach them all of that and the variations, the appropriate variational response to the different conditions. And so when we... When we do in enterprise learning, we need to start with what is the process and what are the outputs? How may that vary? And then what are the knowledge and skills required for people to perform in those processes and then help them uh, enable their 
uh, performance, which is either giving them, again, the performance guides so they can read it and, and follow it, whether that's uh, in the buried in the software or a post-it note on their on the side of their computer, or we've given them a learning experience with plenty of practice with feedback so that they would have honed that memorization and honed the skills that are necessary so that they're available on demand. Yep, yep, that makes complete sense. Thank you for that, Kai. And uh, I think the next one um, that I want to move on to, it's uh, because I always focus on really understanding what's the end or, you know, begin with the end in mind. That, exactly. uh, and that's where you need to understand what is it that you are going to measure to really uh, sort of figure out if you have achieved what you're uh, trying to achieve. And that's where, you know, I have this... Um, confusion that we are talking about measuring uplift impact and uh, something which is easily sort of, um, uh, if you can describe whether it's become faster and cheaper, it's easy to measure. But with the changes, in, especially in the tech space, there are um, new skills that like brand new, you do not really have a baseline. You cannot really easily articulate whether it's faster and cheaper. So in those kind of scenarios, uh, how do you measure uplift or impact? But I, so I, I think that, uh, you know, people are on the payroll to produce outputs that are inputs to somebody else. Uh, I do interview, I create an interview guide. I conduct interviews to interview data. I give it to you. You create a script uh, that gets approved eventually after some review cycles. Then you produce a storyboard. Then you have it off to the video department and they they do a video. So there's a chain of performance here and we should be measuring outputs and whether outputs are produced better, faster and cheaper by the task performance of the people, the individual or the team or however that works. Now, when you get into this notion of skills, skill, this is... Uh, so this has been an issue. This is just the latest edition of this issue that used to be called behaviors. Uh, then it became competencies. Too often we take a, a behavior or a competency and nowadays a skill and we try to address it. But if we don't understand how is that skill applied in somebody's workflow, in their task performance to produce an output, we can't measure whether we're having an impact. Maybe we give somebody a brand new skill and it slows them down and the product is produced better, slower, and, and more expensive. You know, mm -hmm. and so that's that's not a good thing. So the baseline is always what were people doing before? Now, there, of course, there's things where you weren't doing something before, but now you're doing it and and you don't have a baseline to compare it to. All you can do is, is measure where how did we start? Are we getting better over time? and establishing, you know, a, a trend for performance of, you know, better the quality aspects of something, uh, faster the cycle time, the touch time involved in doing something, meeting deadlines, there's all sorts of time aspects, and then the costs of doing all of that. Um, what we're looking for is improvement. We either need to improve performance or help a, an organization sustain performance. If they have a lot of turnover, we don't want their performance to degradate and, and deteriorate. We want to help them maintain their performance levels of what they were doing before, despite the fact that people are coming and going. So, so the whole notion of skills, as I said, was it used to be competencies 20, 30 years ago. And before that, it was behaviors. And one of my heroes in the business, the late Tom Gilbert, wrote a book in 1978 called Human Competence. And he bemoaned the cult of behaviors. And, mm -hmm. and what he was worried about was that too often the people in the instruction, training, and learning business are focused on some enabler, like a behavior. And they don't really understand what's the terminal accomplishment or output that's produced. And so behaviors can be appropriate or inappropriate depending on the context and the output. So sometimes you need to be nice and sweet, and sometimes you need to be firm and demanding. You know, that's just one example. But so there's a situational appropriateness to behaviors. There's, and how do you apply that in that work? If you're if you're supposed to do active listening, if you're at the customer complaint window or, mm -hmm. uh, or a, a customer support organization, 
you handle and you do your active listing differently than if you're in a sales position, uh, if you're a teller in a bank, as an example. Um, and so there's different contexts, different tasks and outputs that are to be produced. So active listening plays out differently. So this notion that we we know that things are changing, so duh, I guess that means there'll be new skills required and we need to upskill and reskill or just skill individuals. Well, that's fine and that's true, but if we don't understand the context, the performance that that plays out, that that impacts, we can train on skills, but we don't have anything to measure other than learning activities. How many people took the skills course? How many people really felt engaged? How many people actually finished the thing before dropping out? We're, we're stuck in measuring learning activities rather than business results. And we need to focus on business results, which means whatever skill you can identify, we need to understand how it applies in this job and how it might be different in another job, in a third job, in a fourth job. We too often, for the entire time, my time in the field, we try to do one size fits all instruction, training, and learning. And that doesn't work. We we give people content and expect them to figure out how to apply it in their workflow, which means we 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 leave them, we give them formal learning and then expect them to do informal learning. And that may or may not work out so well. Eventually, they may be effective, but it certainly isn't efficient. And so we need to help the learner understand how to apply what we're teaching them, what they are learning in their work performance that's authentic to exactly what they have to do back on the job. Does that help? Right. It, that helps, Guy. And, you know, uh, your talk, I mean, you know, what I understand is the personalization is very important, like a person performing a certain kind of role and the learning, uh, the learning needs to be customized or catered to that. How do you do it at scale? Like when you're talking about, you know, teams of thousands of people performing different kind of roles. Well, it, it's it's certainly not, you know, so it can't be the one size fits all. That just doesn't work. Now, there that is not, maybe I'm overgeneralizing just a bit because there are things that we can teach people. And uh, when I was at Motorola back in 1981, I served manufacturing materials and purchasing organizations. And I was asked to to bring in some education on computers in the factory because there weren't computers in the factory way back then because I'm that old. And and so. I was a purist. I thought this should be training. But my client said, we don't have computers in the factory, but they're coming. We're going to put a, we're going to computers all over the factory floor. And we need our people to start thinking now before we put them in place, what the heck they might do with those things. They're the ones who understand their performance. They're the ones who will figure out how they can take advantage of computers that are accessible to them and they will improve their jobs. They will do the continuous improvement of their own work processes. So we need to give them some education on that. So there is a time and a place for education where we don't teach them how to apply it. We just give them awareness, knowledge, and some basic skills, but we don't know how that, that's gonna play out in their work performance. But most of the time we can do that and we should do that if it's really critical. So. If we're going to give skills to everybody, we should figure out who are the key players, performers in the key processes, and we need to target them and help them learn that skill and how to apply it in their job. And we might have to have multiple versions of that. Do we need to have that for every job in the company? No, because some jobs are less impactful to our, our business processes, our, our customer service, our reputation. So we it's this one size fits all. We feel like everybody is of equal importance. They aren't. Um, every job is of equal importance. They aren't. Every job should get equal amounts of training and educational experiences. Most companies can't afford to do that. They have to prioritize where they're going to make strategic investments for impact, for a return on those investments. And so 
I, I think that that's kind of at the root of this. So we can do skills and we can we can help people take those skills and 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 we can teach them how to apply them in their jobs. There may be a case where we don't know exactly and we hope that they'll figure that out. So we give them something to get them started. Um, but, but for the most part, skills, those are huge investments. And if we buy a generic library of content, most people are not going to be able to take that content, learn that content, and figure out how to apply it in their job. So it'll be a wasted investment of their time, the money that we spend on these things. And we can take generic content and bookend it, tell people why they need to learn this, why, how it applies in their job, let them take the generic content, and on the back end, we can give them practice with feedback. But we have to build that custom content to go along with the generic content. The the skills mania that's going on currently uh, for a number of years now um, sure. is the same as the competency mania from 30 years ago. And these, right. all these things have face validity. You hear the names of them and you go, yes, of course they need, everybody needs that or a lot of people need that. But, but it doesn't have the performance validity until we make it performance-based, performance-oriented, performance-impactful. Absolutely. Makes sense. And is there like a performance uh, measurement model that you refer to or use? Yeah, I look at, again, I focus on the output that people produce, mm -hmm. and I establish the baseline now. You can talk about better, faster, and cheaper, and each organization generally has a set of labels for how they measure things. It's it re, it's reflected in their in their key process or performance indicators, the KPIs that you hear about. Um, and so there's a, a a root set of how organizations look at things, uh, and so you need to go investigate that and find out how your organization. Uh, looks at measuring performance, measuring outputs, measuring task performance. Tasks are performed by human beings or machines or a combination of the two, right? So so sometimes things are automated and that happens and then we get the answer and then we do it. It's a handoff from the machine to us and maybe we fed information to the machine. So we can we can look at, are we doing things better and faster and cheaper? And those are just general phrases, but 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 the better is our quality. So the quality could be consistency. It could be um, it has a uniform, the look and feel. Again, that's consistency. Um, it could meet certain criteria that are established by regulatory bodies or the customers or both. Um, and so we need to know how the customer, downstream customer, and how the other stakeholders measure outputs. What's important to them? If we want good outcomes, our products need to meet the regulatory requirements. Well, what are they? And those are the that's how we would measure the output from the regulators' stakeholders' perspective. But the customer may may want all of that plus other aspects. And so we have to understand what does the customer require of our output, which is an input to them. And and the regulators may care about. Uh, the process that we use to produce those outputs. So they care about the output and they care about how we did it. What's the process behind that? And we need to know what those requirements are um, and what do our management, you know, maybe there's some safety issues. So our fellow employees, they have safety concerns so the guy doesn't hurt everybody because he screws up. So there are various stakeholders and we need to understand how do they measure outputs how do they measure the process performance uh that that produces those outputs oh that makes perfect sense thank you for that guy and um the next one i wanted to move on to i think i'm thinking of the question from you know my perspective as an individual learner so when you want to obviously get better some uh, at something at work we um uh, look at these different pillars, the education, exposure, experience, and the environment that you're in. And uh, many a times, like uh, uh, what we do as individual learners is uh, sort of consume a lot of information and say, get certified. And I'm a certified professional on this particular thing. And uh, then you dive in and you realize, oh my God, I don't know how to apply <laughs> 
the knowledge that I have acquired. So in terms of L&D professionals enabling the smooth flow, um, is there any thought that you want to share on how do we come up with that smooth flow or smooth guidance through this, you know, moving through these pillars of education, exposure, experience, and, you know, make sure that the environment around is um, uh, supporting you with the learning. Yeah, this has to do primarily with transfer. So if you were to look at the Kirkpatrick model, the four levels of evaluation and the, or the Phillips five levels of evaluation, everybody's kind of relabeled these things. But but the first thing is, you know, the first level is reaction. Did people like it? Was the room comfortable? Did they like the snacks? The level two is mastery. Did they master the objectives that we had for them, the learning objectives, which should be tied to performance objectives? Uh, did it transfer back to the job? And so this is, I think, the part you, if you get certified in something and you've mastered all of that, now it's a trick to transfer to the job to figure out how does that fit my job exactly? And if you're taking an education or a certification program by somebody else, they don't know exactly how you're going to apply this. So they can't tell you. They could tell you maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that, maybe it's like this other approach, but they can't get specific. So this is where supervisors need to provide that kind of guidance. They need to tell you, here's how you're going to use this in the job. Here's how I would measure that. And I, as a supervisor, could see you, I should monitor your work. I should give you corrective and reinforcing feedback. I should tell you when you did that well, what was good about that. And I should tell you where you need to make improvements, where you didn't things do quite right and how to rework that and redo that so you get it right. And you'll learn from that experience. So, so this is the hand-holding that's sometimes required you know, sometimes we can put people through uh, instruction, training, and learning, and we can get it so close to exactly what they've got to do that they can go back to the job and just do it. Yeah. Sometimes it's not that easy. There's variances because uh, you go to a different part of the company. I go to a different part of the company. Our customers are different. We have to do things just slightly differently. The supervisor is critical, or some of my peers who work alongside me if they exist, they can help me understand how to apply this into our specific work. And, and so this becomes kind of tricky here. This is that transfer issue. We'll never have imp impact if it doesn't transfer. So that's the fourth level of, uh, of evaluation in, in most of these models. But, the, but that third level transfer is something that's tricky. And sometimes we need to make sure that there's transfer support generally by a supervisor, not always. It could be one of my peers working with me in a team if that's available. And they can watch me apply this and they can give me feedback and, and help me, you know, begin to apply this and begin to build fluency, which is the ability to do things and do them quicker and quicker up to whatever the 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 cycle should be you know we, we if we expect people to be doing things in two minutes they may come out of training and take four minutes eventually they we hope they, they'll get down to two minutes in doing the task beautiful beautiful thank you so much guy and uh now i think i'll ask you a few questions based on you know um it, it's more targeted to you guy the lnd professional okay. so uh, <laughs> what are your top skills that you have honed through the years, which has really, really helped you do your work uh, well? All right. So I think one of them is communications. Communications are central to everything that we do. So when I'm talking to prospects or clients, I need to have good verbal and written communication skills when I'm dealing with them. I have to be sensitive and be able to read them and, and how they're feeling. So I gotta be re be reactive appropriately to them. I gotta see if they're hurried, then I shouldn't take forever to explain something. I need to adjust my, my own behaviors, especially my communication behaviors to the situation. Um, and so that's the communication behaviors are really key and central to just about everything. The other thing I think that was really important is that I'm a project planner. I believe in detailed project plans. I believe in managing to the plan. Uh, for my 40 years as a consultant, I have 
strive to hit my deadlines. I want to be predictive. If the project is going to take three weeks, three months, six months, I know what my milestones are that I'm going to hit. When will I be done with analysis? When will I be done with design? When will I be done with development and ready to go to pilot test? When will that be over? When will we finally revise it and be able to release it and have everybody start taking this? So that's project planning. You've got to understand your own process. You've got to understand you know, how long things take. Um, but so project planning is really a key and critical skill. And I think the, I'm, I'm a, I'm a very good analyst. I, I can analyze performance. I can analyze the knowledge and skills required to perform. And I was trained well with a very solid model starting the first week I was out of college and into my first job, uh, because that's what the people that I went to work for, that's what they were all about. They had learned from some of the masters, the gurus back in those days. And I got to take advantage of that because I got taught the same proven processes and how to go about and, and gather the right data that would then inform our design process. I think I'm a pretty good designer too, okay. and I, but I haven't done development for close to 20 years, I bet. Uh, other than uh, s some minor things, but I don't do that. I usually use my my staff or subcontractors to do development and using all the various authoring tools and things like that. I have a radio TV film degree, but I but I wouldn't do my clients videos. I would hire that to somebody who's an expert in it because I haven't done it in a long time at, at that level that that's usually required. Right. And I, I love doing analysis to uh, guide. How do you mindfully avoid getting into the paralysis situation when you're deep into analysis? How do you, how do you, so uh, this is, this is a huge issue analysis paralysis. Most people don't know exactly what they need for their downstream steps. So they, yeah. uh, in the quality movement back in the seventies and eighties, they had a phrase, don't boil the ocean for a cup of tea. And too often, what I've seen the mistakes that some analysts make is that they're not sure exactly what they need. So they get everything and it takes them forever and they get stuck, they get stymied and and they're worried about, I, I need more time to do, and it just takes too long and there's very little value add. Uh, if you understand your design methodologies, your process, the data that you need to do design, you then can do analysis because you know, this is what I need for my next step. So uh, one of the books I wrote in 2020 as the pandemic started was about conducting instructional analysis in every phase of the project. So when I'm doing intake and project planning, I'm doing analysis. In my second phase analysis, I'm doing the majority of the analysis, but when I'm doing design, I'm doing a little analysis and design. And when I do development, well, I'm doing analysis then because I'm gathering all the details that I need to actually develop the content per the design to meet what the analysis said need to be done. And then I do pilot testing. So I'm doing summative evaluation or analysis after doing the formative up front. And so I'm doing analysis through the whole process. I'm not forcing myself or requiring myself to do it all at one point in time and getting trapped into the paralysis that that leads to. That's right. I'm going to remember and use this, don't boil the ocean for a cup of tea. Yep. That, that's going to be the mantra. And I think on that note, Guy, I, I can't believe how time is flying. What would be your top three tips for someone who's trying to make it in the LND space? Um, so when you're starting off, you're not going to be doing necessarily, generally, client interface and project planning and all of that. You're going to learn how to develop content. This is how I brought in and trained my staff. They were developers first. And then they learned how to do design because as developers, they work with somebody else's design. So they understood what that looked like, what was good, bad, what made it easy for them or not. And then I migrated them to learn how to do design. And then I migrated them how to learn to do analysis. So depending on where you're going in, in the business as you start off, you need to really master how to develop using the deployment delivery technologies 
of your client, of your of your of your uh, your company that you work for. And then I think you need to learn and develop your own design capabilities. Um, and then I think it's really learning the analysis. So kind of beginning and backward chaining, if you will, from developing. Now, some people might come in and, and they do delivery. They're an instructor or a facilitator. And then their 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 role, their progression, it could be different. So, but not everybody wants to be an analyst. I've had a lot of people who wanted to be designers, but didn't want to be analysts. And I had a lot of analysts that didn't want to be designers, but I made them learn development and design and, and analysis because these were my methods and they needed to do that so that I could project plan with confidence that this is going to take two weeks to do it and we'll be done. Well, it's because I have a standard process that varies a little bit. It's a little bit flexible, but it's fairly standard. And so I can be predictive of how long it's going to take touch time and how much cycle time I need to give that touch time. So there's a little bit of room for variances. Um, but I think that that's where most people need to start. They need to get exposed to all the roles, all the various hats we wear in learning and development and decide where is it that they want to go. Um, and in some organizations, you're going to be made to be a generalist and be able to do it all. In other organizations, you might be able to be a specialist and focus in one aspect of this work. And there are a lot of more roles than the three, four that I just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, excellent. Thank you so much. I, I am enjoying every bit of the information that you're sharing because it's making sense. I can relate to it uh, so I can consume it and process it in my own head. You know, thank you so much for that. You're um, welcome. For today, I think uh, this is all that I had in mind. Well, very good. I'm I'm so happy to help you, and uh, please feel free to reach out uh, in the future if you want to continue the dialogue. Absolutely. I mean, it's about uh, you know uh, coming across specific scenarios and then discussing it through. Because as you said, one size doesn't fit all, and one a piece of knowledge or thought process that you have cannot answer all your questions. So you have to keep interacting with people like yourself. And it's it's been excellent. And thank you once again for you know uh, sparing this time and having this chat with me. You're most welcome.